We're going to open the Word for just a few minutes here, share with you something that's in my heart, hopefully encourages you, but also challenges you. Last week, Pastor Tolu talked to you. Uh, did he, did y'all enjoy Pastor Tolu last week? Yeah. Uh, he encouraged you about uh, how God wants to prosper us, but he also wants to, to be in good health. Uh, and so I'm, I want to challenge you to health this year. Um, you know, there's a, there's a verse of Scripture that, uh, where God says, In multiplying, I will multiply. You know, there's a difference between addition and multiplication. If you have zero and you add something to it, you now have something. If you have zero, let's, let's say you wanted some apples. You had zero apples. You add five apples to it. You now have five apples. Multiplication is different, though. It sounds great, but if you have zero apples and you multiply it by five apples, you still have well, how many apples? Because anything times zero is still zero. So what we see is a connection that something is being multiplied by something else. Now I want you to think about your life and consider where you are. Are you healthy? Is there, are the different areas of your life healthy? Or is your life full of issues and problems that you're not able to deal with that are breaking you down? And if God came in and said, in multiplying, I will multiply. If he started multiplying everything in your life, where would you be? I mean, it's fun to preach about and multiply, and God's going to multiply me. But if you are in debt up to your eyeballs and he multiplies your debt, now you're drowning. Are you tracking with me? We think of it in the positive, but wait a minute. God said, in multiplying, I'm going to multiply you. We ought to be careful. We ought to position ourselves so that when God says it's time to multiply in your life, it's time to prosper what you're doing. He's prospering healthy things. He's multiplying healthy things, not unhealthy things. So... Uh, here's what he says in Psalm 92. The, the Bible uh, speaks to us, verse 12. But the godly will flourish. Everybody say flourish. That's a good word. Flourishing seems like a really good plan. But the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow like the cedars of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon in Scripture were known to be tall and strong and beautiful. This is a lovely verse. Why? For they are transplanted to the Lord's own, own house. They flourish where? In the courts of our God. <laughs> Even, verse 14, in old age they will still produce fruit Got some amens on that one. And they will remain vital and green. What a blessing this is that you're going to flourish. This is, you're, you can flourish. You can produce long after you are at an age where you should be producing. You can produce and you can remain vital and green. Man, I want, I want to live my life with vitality. I, 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 want, I want to be like the, the, the prophet Elijah. I don't know if I get this option, but Lord, it, you know. The prophet Elijah was like doing his thing, and then he was walking, and he was doing the work of the Lord, and then boom, the Lord just took him up in a chariot of fire, and that was it. Like, I want to stay vital in my life. Don't let me waste away to nothing and import, a lack of purpose. And No, no, no. As long as I'm here, I want to be vital and apparently green. But we have to ask the question, because this blessing is connected to being planted in a particular place. And if you're planted in the wrong place, this blessing doesn't apply to you. So the question is, where were they planted in order to receive this blessing? And the answer is very clear. They are planted in the courts of our, our God. They are planted in the house of our God. We say, well, I wasn't planted in the house of God. But I, I love this verse. He said they were transplanted. They were, what does that mean? You were planted in one place. 
You were, you were planted in one piece of dirt. You were planted in one garden. And maybe it was a good place and maybe it was a bad place. But somewhere along the way, God said, I want to transplant you from where you are to where I want you, which is in the house of God. If you're here today and you're saying, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a church and I don't, I don't know where I'm supposed to be. And you're praying about a church. Look, I don't know if Triumph is the place for you. But I do believe that that is the Holy Spirit pulling on your heart and pulling on your life and saying you need to get planted in the house of the Lord. All of us, we are better off when we're planted there. Why? Because the soil has a direct impact on what kind of tree can grow. Not everything grows in Southeast Texas. Not everything grows in Houston. I've had a number of chances to go to Alaska. Beautiful state. Absolutely stunning. And when you get off of the plane in Alaska, when you step out, you are hit by this natural smell of the outdoors. It is so, the, the trees, the, the aspens and, and all of these beautiful trees that are up there, it is so strong, it overwhelms you. And, and, it, and it just, it impressed upon me, why, you don't smell these in Texas. Especially not in Southeast Texas. You get a little bit of Exxon Mobil, a little bit of Shell. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? When you get off the plane in Alaska, it is like, Whoa, I mean, it looks like somebody dumped a can of pine saw on the whole state and just, it's there. But it's because different things grow there. Where you're planted has an impact on what will grow in your life. But this is what the Bible says. When you're transplanted to the house of God, you can flourish. I want you to flourish by being planted in the house of God. Now, here's the, here's the problem. we got to be planted somewhere. We've got we've to dive in. We've got to get some roots and this is contrary to Christian culture in America, which is extremely consumer-driven like everything else. Consumer-driven church is not trying to get planted. It's just trying to say, water me, feed me, and then let me go do what I want to. But the Word of God says, no, you get planted, you grow roots, you get involved, you get deep into the house of God. And when that happens, it's the roots that feed the fruit. It's because you've planted and you've got roots going down in the house of God that now you start to see fruit born and your tree begins, your life begins to flourish. So at Triumph, we, we, there's, there's three things that God has called us to do among, uh, I mean, big picture, and there's a lot of ways we go about this, but number one, we want to see the lost saved. Amen. We want to see the lost saved. If you came to the house of God and you don't know Jesus today, don't leave this place without knowing Jesus. <laughs> You need to come to this altar. You need to, to grab hands with someone. Let them lead you in a prayer. Not that the, there's any uh, magic sauce in the prayer, but what it is is a vocal declaration that I now belong to Jesus and I believe that he's the son of God. We want to see the lost saved. But secondly, I don't want to leave you there. I want to see the saved discipled. Okay, great. You were lost. Now you're found. That's wonderful. But that isn't what, that's not what all that Jesus called us to do. I'll show it to you in, ver in Scripture here in a moment. And then once you start being discipled, I don't want to leave you there either. Because it is really hard being a disciple until you realize the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gave us to go to work in our heart and our life. So now we want to see the disciples empowered because that's how we can really start living the, the Christian life that he's called us to. If you were to read the New Testament, you would say Jesus was the Son of God who somehow died on a cross but rose again and changed the world. And then you would say, and Jesus left us the Holy Spirit to empower us to change the world for the sake of the gospel. You need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen this morning? So here, here's this verse, and it's, it's one of the most core verses that we see in Scripture. You call it, we call it the Great Commission. This is what Jesus said as he was, one of the things he said as he was leaving the earth. Therefore, this is instructions, go and get people to fill out salvation cards. Is that what he said? No, no, no. He said, go and make Disciples, you are saved instantaneously. 
The moment you say, I believe in Jesus Christ, he is my Lord, he is my Savior, uh, forgive me of my sins, you are saved just like that. You can be, we know this because when the thief was hanging on the cross, Jesus said, you will be with me today, you will be with me in paradise. It happens in just a moment like that. But making disciples takes time. It takes work. You have to make something. You have to build something. You have to shape something. You have to mold something. But this is what Jesus said. I want you to go and I want you to make disciples. I get so frustrated. Oh, it just drives me nuts. So please don't ever say this about triumph. Because it sounds really good on social media, okay? It sounds really good until you think about it for a moment. You ever have people say that they make these arguments that sound great and then you push back a little bit and their whole argument breaks down. Here's one of them. Man, the church is a hospital for broken people. And we're just full of messed up, broken, fallible humans. We're all sinners. We're all filthy. Speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. Make no mistake, this is a hospital. But you know what hospitals do? They heal people. They take the people that are sick and they get them healthy. They take the people with broken bones and they, make them, they help them get strong again. What we are is a hospital, but we don't just stay broken all the time. Making excuses for our sin, making excuses for our addiction, making excuses for our problem. No, we are a hospital. Come on in. We'll take care of you. We'll feed you the word of God. We'll give you medicine to your soul. We'll love on you. We'll hug on you. We'll give you care. But at some point, get yourself out of the bed and start helping. We've got to make the shift in our lives from being patients to being staff. If you want to be planted in the house of God, you can help helping someone else heal. One of the most encouraging things you can do for the difficult places in your life is start serving other people. And watch how it starts changing you. When you start being the hands and feet of Jesus, you look up and you're not hurting as bad as you used to be. You're not as wounded as you used to be. Why? Because Jesus is working in you while you're helping other people. Disciples, man, disciples grow, disciples are changing, disciples are moving. I want to ask you this question. Do you look just like you did a year ago? Do you know more about Jesus? Do you know more about the Bible? Do you know more about your walk with God? Is your life progressed? Is your marriage better? Is your family, are you a better father than you were a year ago? I'm not mad at how you were when you got here. But man, if you've been here 10 years, five years, I know you're getting taught the word of God every week. You've got opportunities to be involved in small groups to grow as a disciple. Something should be growing and changing in you because that's what happens with disciples. You're not, we want to jump to the flourishing part, but we want to skip the building and the growing part. When we moved into our house five years ago, part of our neighborhood is you have to have a fruit tree in the front yard. We didn't get to pick it. They planted it for us. We were like, oh, great. This is awesome. We've got a fruit tree. We've never had a fruit tree before. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna bear fruit. We're going we're gonna to make our own. We're going to have fruit at our table from our tree. It's going to be a great thing. It's been five years. We, we don't have one lemon yet. Not one. I don't know what's going on in my yard. (laughs) But that tree's been through some stuff, you know. When it went through that bad freeze a couple years ago, it got, I mean, it it died all the way down to a little nub. I thought that was the end of its life. No, it has come back. Still here. No fruit. (laughs) Hey, some of us are like that, and I'm glad that you're still here. You made it through some hell in the last few years of your life. But this year you're going to grow fruit. This year you're going to flourish. This year you're going to prosper. This year something's going to be born in your life that's going to change. This is your year. This is your time. Um, so, So number one, Jesus said, go and make disciples. And then he said something even more challenging. He said, of all nations. No, at the time the disciples didn't even understand what Jesus meant because they were only looking at this through a Jewish lens. 
Jesus was prophesying something here that they couldn't even, it wasn't until Acts chapter 10 or so that they could even embrace what God is doing because he says, now I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. They had to make room in their life, in their theology, in their culture for all nations. This is a decision that has to be made in your life. I'm going to make room for people who don't look like me, talk like me, act like me, think like me. They came from a different place and a different culture. And yet Jesus said, I want you to make disciples of all of them. I love this church because when you look around, you see people from everywhere. Everywhere. But is there room in your life for all nations? And is there, is there room on your, on your row for all nations? Is there room in your, on, your row for, in, on your row for people who don't look like you and think like you? Is there, can I tell you, FYI, we're in an election year, in case you have been living under a rock somewhere. Is there room in your life for people who don't vote like you? Make room. All nations, it's about, it's about honoring people. It's about honoring people. Can you honor people um, that come from a different place? I, 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 I love the, this church family because you really do honor all people a, a, as a whole. This is what we do, and, and I thank you for that. Uh, February is Black History Month. Again, unless you've been living under a rock somewhere, you should know this. Um, and what is Black History Month? It's a time to honor uh, black Americans and black history and, and recognize the challenges that have been faced to get to where we are today and the progress that still needs to happen in this nation, not just for black uh, Americans, but for minorities and people groups all, all across this nation that have been pressed down. Uh, we can do better at honoring people and lifting people up. And so I, I, I want to take a minute and just show you something in Scripture here. Um, that, and some of you may know this, some of you may not. Uh, but Scripture was a big part of the reason that uh, white Americans, supposedly Christian Americans, were enslaving Africans uh, and treating them like animals, and they were using Scripture to justify it. Now, my challenge to you is this. This is something we've seen throughout history where people have used the Bible to harm other people. And what they relied on is the lack of education around them. So if we don't let our slaves learn to read, then they can never read the Bible for themselves to know that what I'm telling you the Bible says, the Bible doesn't say. Right? You see, this is not just in America. You've seen this throughout history. But I want to show you something. And it, uh, so I want to take you back very quickly to Genesis, uh, Genesis uh, chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, right through there. You see the story of the flood. You see Noah. You remember the story the animals got on the ark, and then he covers the earth. So everybody's dead except for Noah and his family. So now the earth has to be repopulated through Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, right after this happens, Noah... Sleeping in his tent and they're, they're, you know, repopulating the earth, whatever. Noah gets plastered. And by plastered, if you don't know what I mean, because you also have been living under a rock, <laughs> he is drunk out of his mind. He's got one of those, dr- he is so passed out drunk that he is naked in his tent. Some of you have been there. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> and so um, Ham... His youngest son comes in and sees him, and rather than covering covering him up with a blanket, he goes out and tells his two older brothers, hey, Shem, Japheth, um, I don't know what's going on in here, but dad's naked in his tent. And and so Shem and and Japheth, they grab a a cloth, and they back into the tent, because they don't want to see their dad like this, and they lay the cloth over the top of him. When Noah wakes up, he gets very upset with him, and he is embarrassed And he feels dishonored by Ham because rather than Ham covering him up, Ham went and told his brothers. There's a number of of reasons that theologians say this was such a big deal, but the core of it was um, Noah felt dishonor, so he decides to curse the son of Ham. 
Now, this is, this is really important. I'm going to read you these verses. I'm going to show you uh, how this, this theology was twisted throughout history to give uh, uh, the, the biblical uh, right to these men to enslave African people. So, chapter 9, uh, I want to show you these verses. If you'll put that up on the screen for me, guys. Verse 24. Are you all okay right now? You want to learn something today? When Noah... Woke up from his stupor, he learned what Sam, his, uh, Ham, not Sam, Ham, <laughs> his youngest son had done. Uh, then he cursed Canaan. Everybody say Canaan. Canaan. Now, Ham was Noah's youngest son. So Noah now curses Canaan, who is Ham's youngest son. So he said, man, I'm feeling dishonored by my youngest son. I'm going to dishonor your youngest son. He said, may Canaan be cursed. May he be the lowest of servants to his relatives. Verse 26, then Noah said, may the Lord, the God of Shem, be blessed. So he says to Shem, you be blessed. And may Canaan, his nephew, be his servant. May God expand the territory of Japheth, and may Japheth share the prosperity of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So Ham messed up. Canaan has to pay the price. Here's the problem. So what these men did was they decided that they were going to use this curse, the curse against a Ham's son as a mechanism to enslave African people. Because one of Noah's sons was the name Cush. Cush means burnt skin or burnt face. Cush settled, and let me put this map up here and I'll show you. So this, this is a map of the region. Um, so over here you have Africa all going this way. And this is the direction that Ham came. Everywhere that is in this uh, peach color, color is where Ham and his sons uh, spread out to to fill the earth. Now I want you to note where Cush went. Cush went down to Africa, depending on exactly who you're reading, somewhere between Sudan and Ethiopia is where he settled and began to spread out from there. Cush was named Burnt Skin because he was, he was dark-skinned or black and now we have uh, African people, many of which have dark skin. Makes sense, right? Nothing, contra not, nothing controversial here. It's just how the Lord spread this thing out. Shem, he's over here in this area. Now, right down here, it would be uh, what's called Ur of the Chaldeans. This is an important place because it's where Abraham came from when God called Abram out of the land of Ur of the Chaldeans into the promised land. So he was down here. He's a descendant of Shem. He comes up and around into the promised land. Japheth, Japheth goes up into what we would call Europe up through here and then some over into the eastern part of the world. Uh, if you, uh, Many of the white European people came from our descendants of Japheth. Are you tracking with me now? Now let's go back to our story. Men corrupted the word of God to say Cush is cursed to be a servant to Shem and Japheth. The first African slaves, uh, or the first slaves in, in, the, in Arabia were pulled from this exact area in Ethiopia as sons or descendants of Cush and determined that they were cursed because of this story. But I read it to you. It wasn't Cush. Who's, which son was cursed? Canaan. Now let's fast forward into to biblical history and see how much you know because you've heard this name Canaan before. Put my map back up there for me, guys, if you would, really quickly. So I want you to note where Canaan is. Canaan is right over here, and if I were to overlay a modern-day map or a biblical map, you would see that Canaan is where Israel is. Why? Because the land of Canaan and his descendants are the one when God spoke to Abram and said, I'm giving you the land of Canaan. 
Why? Because there was a curse on the son of Ham, Canaan, and he would be subservient to the sons of Shem. So when God said, I'm picking a land for my chosen people, he chose the land of Canaan and drove them out, made many of them uh, subservient. Do, do you see what happened? You see, God fulfilled his own promise, but not through Cush. That's the wrong brother. It's the wrong brother. And yet, this is what we did to, for Christians to justify enslaving African people. Well, they're cursed, and they're supposed to be our slaves. No, that was the people of Canaan. Wrong brother. Now let me fast forward in scripture one more time. Um, do you remember when Jesus is carrying the cross? And man, he's, he's already been to the whipping post. He has been beaten. It, it, it is, we don't even know how was, he was still standing. He, his body had been so destroyed by the cat of nine tails. And yet he is forced to carry his own cross. And he is dragging it down the road trying to get to Calvary. And he stumbles and he falls. And the Bible teaches us that the soldiers grabbed a man by the name of Siren. Simon the Cyrene. Simon the Cyrene. And he said, you carry his cross. Now, let me put you some historical context that you know. The two people groups in this world that have been the most enslaved and mistreated around the world historically. Now, not the only ones, but the two most would be African people and Jewish people. These are the two. You know this in history. So here is a Jewish man carrying a cross. And the Roman soldier grabs Simon the Cyrene. This was a place on the northern tip of where? Africa. The Bible doesn't tell us, but historians believe that he was a black man from Africa. And he reaches down with his two sons watching, and he picks up the cross of Jesus, and he carries it with Jesus, barely making it behind him where they hang Jesus on the cross. Now I want you to pause for a moment. And I, I can't prove this in Scripture because the Bible just doesn't say. He says he's Simon the Cyrene. But if our historians are correct, you have a picture here where two men representing two of the most enslaved and abused and mistreated people in the history of the world carry a cross, one of the most inhumane, evil devices of torture and yet what the world didn't know was that cross was going to deliver freedom and salvation to the world in a way that they didn't even realize yet God was grabbing together two uh, people to represent the most wounded and enslaved and mistreated people and saying to them I'm going to use you to carry this cross and release freedom to the world that no man can take away. This is, this is the kind of God that we serve. And yet humanity tries to twist it and mess it up. Listen, God loves his people. He loves his people. He said in his commission... Go and make disciples of all nations. Of all nations. We all need this freedom. We all need the freedom that, that, would, that the cross delivered to us. I'm so grateful for what Christ did, aren't you? And I'm grateful that Simon the Cyrene was there to carry that cross and be a part of history. Man, I hope that he has a special place in heaven. I'm out of time this morning, uh, and so I'm going to land this plane. Maybe I'll, I'll pick this sermon up next week and finish my illustration that's obviously sitting right there. It's going to be good. But I want to, I want to challenge you in your life with this. I, I believe that God wants you to flourish. 
I believe he wants you to flourish, but you've got to get planted. You've got to get planted, and you've got to embrace, I must be a disciple. I've got to be a disciple. I've got to get involved. I've got to get rooted. I've got to grow. If you're not planted, you need to get planted. If you're praying about being a member of Triumph, I hope you will. We've got space for here. We've got room for you here. And I can tell you that there are people growing and flourishing all over this church, all of our campuses. This is a good place to get the word of God in you and to see what he has for your life. I want to pray a blessing over you, and then we're going to open our altars, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll continue. How many want to continue t- talking about this some more? All right. Stand with me, if you will. If you're watching online this morning, thank you for being a part. If you're in the area, I'm encouraging you to come in person. Don't stay at home. It's okay online. It's great when you're with the people of God. Come and join us. This is my personal invitation to you. I want to bless you today. And then we're going to open these altars. If you need prayer ministry of any kind, we serve a God that is more than able to show up in your life and come through for you. And so our pastors and elders and our prayer partners are going to make themselves available in just a moment. Uh, If you're one of those people that say, Pastor, I need to give my life to Jesus. Don't leave this place. Don't leave this place without coming to this altar. It will only take a few minutes. We'll celebrate with you and lead you into the kingdom of God. Uh, May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. And may he put his name, the name of Jesus Christ, on you. And you say, God bless you. I love you. These altars are open. Come, let us pray with you. Don't forget to sign up uh, for small groups, uh, adopt a child, or to be a part of our uh, uh, A-Leaf Middle School program. God bless you.